close your eyes. Watch your breath. Hold on to the breath. Whatever else comes up in your mind, don't let go of the sensation of the breathing. As the breath comes in, the breath goes out. And try to make yourself interested in the breath to see what kind of breathing feels good, what kind of breathing is good for the body. If you're tired, what kind of breathing will give you more energy? If you're wired, what kind of breathing will calm you down? And as you begin to see the effect that the breath has on the body and has on the mind, that's going to get you even more attached to the breath, which is a good thing. Our minds have a habit of latching on to whatever comes by. And all the Buddha talks about letting go. Not everything is let go. One of the customs of the Noble Ones is you delight in letting go, but you also delight in developing. There are certain things you've got to work on, certain things you have to bring into being. So you can have something to hold on to as you start learning how to let go of other things that are really weighing down the mind. If you look at the duties of the Four Noble Truths, the first three all revolve around dispassion. You comprehend the aggregates. Well, to comprehend them means that you overcome passion for them. You try to abandon craving feel, by feeling dispassion for it. And then the cessation of suffering is the actual dispassion for craving. But when you get to the path, you have to have some passion. Because you've got to build these things. You've got to build virtue, you've got to build concentration, you've got to build discernment. So you have something good to hold on to. And in John Lee's phrase, the Buddha doesn't set you adrift. And by the time it comes when you let go of everything, you let go not like a pauper who doesn't have anything to let go to begin with. You let go like a rich person. The rich person lets go, and the rich person still has all the wealth and all the other things that he or she amassed. It's just they're not holding on to it all the time. It's there for them to use. The Buddha and his noble disciples developed virtue, concentration, discernment. Even after they let go of these things, they still had them to use. So again, it's not like you're being set adrift. By learning how to hold on to the breath, you can start looking at your other attachments with a little bit more objectivity and a little bit more dispassion. You don't feel quite so desperate and hanging on to things. It's not that everything is going to be easy to let go. But you have to understand, why does the Buddha have you let go of things? Because after all, you're, you can latch on to things that are going to outlast you. But then the fact that you're impermanent and constant means that you're setting yourself up for a fall. I've been reading some books on the Eightfold Path. And one of the strange things is that when they define right view, they define it in terms of the three characteristics. In other words, you start out with these three characteristics interpreted as metaphysical principles, like there is nothing permanent in life, there is no permanent self. And then in the context of that, then they say they place the vulnerable truths. In other words, people suffer because they don't understand the truth of no self. And when you understand that truth, they say you stop suffering. But that's not how the Buddha taught. To begin with, they didn't teach the three characteristics as metaphysical principles. They're perceptions that you apply to things, and you apply them strategically in line with the duties of the Four Noble Truths. Then you also apply them selectively as you work on the path. Like when you're working on your virtue, you're working on your precepts, you apply the three perceptions to anything that would pull you away from your virtue. In other words, you learn to see your wealth and your relatives, your concern for your health as impermanent things. And so in any place where they get in the way of serving the precepts, you apply these perceptions to say that these things are not really worth holding on to. The precepts are much more valuable. You hold on to those. The same with concentration. 
when you're doing concentration, you're actually working against the three characteristics. You're trying to get the mind under your control, make it solid and steady, and give rise to a sense of well-being. You apply the three characteristics to anything that would pull you out of concentration, or as you're getting deeper into concentration, anything that would take you back to a weaker level of concentration. And even when you're working on discernment, you've got to hold on to these three perceptions for a while as you apply them to everything, including the concentration. But then there comes a point where you let them go, too. In other words, the perceptions are there as tools for helping with the duties of the Four Noble Truths. So always keep that in mind, that the context is the Four Noble Truths and the three perceptions function within that context. This becomes important when you find yourself holding on to things that you think are constant. And you can ask yourself, are they, even if it's constant, the fact that I'm holding on it means there's something wrong. Because being in the position of clinging, which the Buddha defines in terms of feeding on things, the fact that you have to feed on something, puts you in a weak position. In a position where they're suffering. Because you have to be concerned, how much longer can I feed on this? The activity of clinging is in and of itself the suffering. That may sound like this applies only to the higher levels of the path, but it's good to keep this in mind from the very beginning. One, in case you run across something that seems permanent in your meditation and you want to hold on to it, you have to ask yourself, well, is this worth holding on to right now? Notice that question. It's, it's a value judgment. All too often we hear that insight is all about having no judging at all, but that's not the case. You have to decide if you're going to cling to something or not cling to something. There's an alternative. In some cases it's worth it, in some cases it's not. And you've got to learn how to pass judgment on things well, and see the allure that they have, you know, why do you like holding on to them, and look at the drawbacks of holding on. And if you see that the good things that come from that are actually worth it, okay, you hold on for the time being. But with the realization that eventually you're going to have to let go of everything. But you want to let go strategically. Yes, there are some things, of course, that we know are impermanent, and we still hold on. It's very difficult to let go. And the Buddha's way of dealing with that is twofold. One, a reflection that we chant often, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. All I have is my karma, that fivefold contemplation. In the original sutta, it doesn't stop there. It goes on to remind you that everybody is subject to these things. Everywhere you go, aging, illness, death, separation, people have nothing but their karma. And when you can learn to reflect on your particular attachments in the light of the universality of this principle, it helps to take some of the sting out of it, that you see these things in perspective. And realizing that you don't know how many lifetimes you've been holding on to things and being forced to let go. You hold on to things that you really love and can't imagine living without, and you've got to let go. It's happened over and over and over again. And on the one hand, you've suffered all this, and on the other hand, however, you've survived. As Jama Habuya says, this, the mind is, a, is an expert survivor. But still, it's creating a lot of unnecessary suffering. You have to ask yourself, have you reached the point where you've had enough? Then you're in a much better position to ask that question when you've really learned how to hold on to your path that you're developing right here. You realize that it is something good. So when you let go of other things, you're not totally set adrift. Which is one of the reasons why we work at this again and again and again, so that your concentration does get reliable. 
that you can have experience and seeing how it will help you through difficulties. Your virtue, your concentration, your discernment, these are the things that protect you. These are the things that will shore you up when everything else falls away. But that's true only if you've worked on them well enough. Which is why it's okay to be attached to the concentration. As John Fuhring used to say, you've got to be crazy about meditation if it's going to work. The kind of thing where it's almost like an addiction. You find a few spare moments here and there and you focus on your breath. It's like a person who's addicted to cigarettes. You find a few spare moments, you light up a, light up a cigarette. But here's an addiction that goes in a good way. The Buddha calls this a, a devotion to pleasure that's actually skillful. You remember the statement at the beginning of the, his very first sermon, that devotion to sensual pleasures is one extreme. But then there's the devotion to the pleasure of concentration. That's something else. And that's actually good. It's part of the path. It's part of the middle way. A pleasure that's actually conducive to developing clarity and discernment of the mind. So work on your concentration to make sure it's something you can rely on. Work on your virtue. Work on your discernment. When the Buddha says that the self is its own mainstay, that's true only if you are able to make yourself a reliable, a reliable meditator. So hold on here. Learn how to hold on well. And hold on in a way that will help see you clear as things come and go in life. And you learn that you can be okay where they're coming and going because you've got something a lot more reliable inside. 